hold off until the end. Uh, make sure that you sign up over here on the uh, class attendance roster so that I get you credit uh, for being here. But you can do that at the end. Um, the, uh, the topic of the, uh, of the slideshow, I don't know how well my point is going to show up, but uh, some of my classes, I was teaching a sport history class in the fall. Dr. Best contacted me about uh, making a presentation, and he mentioned the, the uh, uh, the theme that the library had going on this year, and they were connecting uh, popular culture through television programs or maybe movies or books to different academic disciplines. And he asked me to put some thought into a way we might be able to apply that to sport. Well, those of you who've had me in the sport history class know that I start off sometimes talking about uh, making connections with sport and how sport touches so many different aspects of American life. And one of the things I do is uh, I'll put up slides with just a picture of a person who's prominent in sport, and I'll ask you to tell me who it is, okay? So it would be like, um, who is this? All right, so Joel says Serena Williams. Everybody says Serena Williams, all right? So that is Serena Williams there. And who is this? All right, Tom Brady. You don't need any introduction or any uh, anything else other than seeing that number 12 Patriots jersey there. And who is this? LeBron James. All right, so we come to the, the next slide that comes up is this guy right here. And this is happening in a class fall semester. Uh, this guy comes up. Okay, so who is this? <laughs> now, Dr. Reese makes an interesting point here, and we're going to return to that theme, uh, Dr. Reese, because uh, my alma mater is the University of Georgia. So when Dr. Best contacted me in the fall, University of Georgia was on this great, magnificent run towards the college football national championship game where they would meet uh, Mr. Saban here, Nick Saban, the head coach at Alabama and the Crimson Tide. Now, Georgia hasn't won a national title since 1980 when I was an undergraduate there. And uh, they, I think Alabama's won one probably since we sat down this morning. So uh, I was going through these slides and I was showing the pictures just like you're seeing. And, you know, I'm calling out a student. I said, okay, Abraham, who is it? Okay, Randy, who is it? Okay, Monica, who is it? So I come to Nick Saban. We've got a student, a graduating senior, Dr. Abernethy knows Jacob Forcero, huge Alabama fan. Right? And so we tease each other back and forth. And so fall semester, I put up, uh, Saban's picture, but I teed it up for him, okay? And he, he hit a 300-yard drive right down the middle because I said, okay, who is this? And he, he looked at him admiringly, and he said, that's God. And uh, so he, he's, uh, he's actually the man who sits on the iron throne of college athletics right now with regard to our, uh, our topic. So it is Nick Saban, but when uh, Dr. Best asked me about, uh, you know, making a presentation, and I was, I think I kind of binged like Game of Thrones recently, and so I thought, well, Game of Thrones, that might tie in pretty well with it. So, um, the quest for the Iron Throne is one of the themes of Game of Thrones, and I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit this morning, and then try to compare it to uh, college athletics, and particularly college football. So. Here's what we'll like. Here's what I'll try to get through in this episode. Again, my reflection is not showing up on here, but I'll give you a storylines explanation briefly of college sport, and then also of the HBO television show Game of Thrones, just as a brief overview. Then I want to talk to you about these different topics: uh, finances in big-time college athletics, finances in small college athletics. And then a, a second theme now of, of Game of Thrones is that winter is coming. So if you don't know what that means, Juliana, you're smiling, you probably know. But winter is coming. And so we, we're going to talk about whether winter is coming in college athletics as well. And then uh, we'll open it up for discussion and questions. But now as we go along, it's very informal. So if you have questions as we move through the, the presentation, uh, please feel free to just raise your hand or stop me and we'll talk about whatever you want to. But that's sort of the outline right there. We'll try to get through those. Dr. Best, you said we had, what, two and a half hours? And Go for it. Okay, well, well, maybe I'll make it 30 minutes, but let's uh, see what we've got. All right, so storylines, let's start off with sport. And I want to give a few definitions of at least the way I characterize sport in my classes. And you'll hear me talk about big-time college sports, big-time college athletics. And when I do that, I'm, I'm really referring to uh, NCAA, this says NCAA Division I, and it says especially the 
football Power Five conferences. So that Atlantic Coast Conference, Big Ten, Big Twelve, Pac Twelve, or, or yeah, Pac Twelve, and then the Southeastern Conference. Those five conferences plus Notre Dame, which is an independent, that's 65 schools or institutions, which would really be considered big time college athletics. Uh, there are many other Division I schools, uh, even competing in football, but not all of them would be considered big time. Second phrase I'll use is mid-sized college athletics. And if you see the descriptors here, uh, mid-sized college athletics can include Division I schools, also some NCAA Division II schools, quite a few of them actually. And then finally, I'll use the phrase small college athletics, and small college athletics we're going to refer to as, again, some of the NCAA Division II schools, NCAA Division III, we can talk about how those are characterized or classified, and then NAIA. St. Thomas is a member of the NAIA as an example. Now in those NCAA categories, uh, the institutions themselves determine how they want to be classified. You have to meet certain criteria for each of those divisions, but a lot of it is just uh, self-reflection by the institution and seeing where they fit best, particularly if you're trying to go from small to mid-size or stay, you know, NAIA to Division II, there's not, there, there are not a whole lot of differences in some of those schools just uh, other than how they want to be classified. So each of these three levels has its own, each of them has their own uh, revenue streams, they have their own expenses, and they have their own issues that they face. And again, each school determines uh, the, the level at which they want to compete, what's the best fit for their given institution. All right, now moving to the TV show. And again, HBO is, uh, Game of Thrones is an, was an HBO series. And I think it only has six episodes left. It's on a long hiatus right now. I think it comes back maybe in July or something like that for the last six episodes. It has some uh, interesting storylines. First of all, it's a historical fantasy. It's, it's, it's based on novels, historical fantasy novels even though towards the end of the series it's gotten a little bit away from it because it's become more of a TV show than strictly based on the novel. Uh, in this historical fantasy there are two continents and there are seven kingdoms, okay? And one of the main storylines is the Iron Throne that I mentioned, and the Iron Throne is a symbolic seat on one of those continents or in one of those kingdoms, and so you have all of this, uh, all of this intrigue that goes on as people vie for the Iron Throne. You have these families and these dynasties and these rulers, and they plot against each other and they go to war with each other. And they're, you know, they they build up armies and they build up uh, riches or or uh, jewels and gold, etc., trying to become the dominant power and reach the Iron Throne. And you can see where I'm going with that as we go to sport. Uh, so that's, that's one of the storylines, uh, good and evil, the alliances that they form, the dynasties and the intrigue that uh, takes place with all of that storyline. The other big storyline is that theme that winter is coming. And uh, this guy right here, I think his, his character is called the Night King, if I'm remembering that correctly. And again, it's been a few months since I've watched any of it. But this theme that winter is coming is a broader theme that, all right, you've got all this stuff going on with these seven kingdoms where they're vying for power and they're trying to overcome each other. But at the same time, from the far north, you have, what would you call them, Juliana? Zombies? Mm, dead walkers. Dead walkers, white walkers, what I think is what they call them. All right, it's this army of the living dead. And they're coming to destroy everything in their path. And so while all of these uh, seven kingdoms and all the rulers and they're going through their battles with one another, another overarching theme is that, hey, you better get it together because winter is coming. And it's, it's breached the wall at the north part of you know, the north kingdom and they're coming in. If you don't pull together, you can be destroyed. Now, so in... 
thinking about Game of Thrones and, you know, these power struggles and some of these broad themes, my thought for our presentation was how to apply or compare some of those themes to college sports, and uh, particularly to college football, but even a little bit broader than that, too. So let's, let's look at how we can apply uh, some of those to college sports. So on the Game of Thrones, there are two, there are two continents, okay? seven kingdoms with all these different rulers. And those continents are Westeros and Essos. Well, in college athletics, you really have two main continents as well. Joel, what are they? What sports? What are the two main sports? Football and men's basketball at the big time level. All right, so th those are the two, th they're the two continents for big time college sports. And if you look at the, I'm not gonna put up too many statistics, but football and men's basketball alone generate more revenue than all other sports combined on NCAA campuses. And actually, football by itself generates more revenue than the next 25 sports. If you go down and count up 25, you know, I don't even know if I can come up with 25 different sports, but 25 sports, football alone generates more revenue than all of those, and that includes men's basketball. So, uh, these two separate themselves with regard to revenue generation, with regard to attention. We've all, you know, a lot of us have been watching March Madness and some of the upsets and all the excitement with that going on. Well, that's, that's one of the premier events and, uh, along with uh, college football. Now, it's not to say that other sports aren't significant and aren't worthwhile. They certainly are, uh, but these two separate themselves with regard to uh, some of our topics. They essentially pay for all other sports on big time college campuses. So when you know there's conversation about paying athletes or revenue generation, other than some niche sports like maybe UConn women's basketball, gymnastics used to be this way at the University of Georgia, baseball at Mississippi State, at the big time level, the only ones that are generating any revenue to pay for the other, for the rest of them are, are uh, men's basketball and football. So they, they basically are paying for everything. Their rulers get the gold too. Remember how one of our themes is, you know, these rulers and these kingdoms vie for uh, goods and gold and all that. Well, look, check this map out. Now this is a couple of years old. I couldn't find an updated one, but it's still pre pretty accurate. And what this map shows is the highest paid public employee in each state. And, and I, 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 even though I couldn't find an updated map, I looked at the updated statistics, there are only 11 states where the highest paid public employee is not the, men's, is not the football coach of a major university or the men's basketball coach at a major university. Only 11 states, so the other, the other states have those as the highest paid employees. So for example, again, this is outdated. At the time, this, this was Billy Donovan at the University of Florida. Now last year, uh, it was Jimbo Fisher, the head football coach at Florida State. Where is he now? Texas A&M, that's right. I, I think him last year there. All right, uh, here at Nick Saban. Here it's now Kirby Smart, University of Georgia. All right, now you, you can tell a lot about the interests of a state by looking at this map. So this is Kentucky. Who would be the highest paid state employee there? Calipari. John Calipari, the head coach of the uh, University of Kentucky. Here, that's North Carolina, another basketball state. Who would that be? Roy Williams. Roy Williams, okay. Uh, head coach of the biggest, you know, the prominent public university in North Carolina. They have another coach there who's been fairly successful too. Who would that be? Yeah, thank you, Doctor. He's five national championships, second only to John Wooden. Uh, but he's at Duke, so private university. So you see, Oklahoma football, Arkansas football, Missouri football, uh, basketball in Arizona, basketball in uh, California. That was probably Steve Alford at UCLA, and that, that's now. If I updated the map color coded wise, that would probably be Chip Kelly at uh, UCLA. So you see that. Uh, sport is prominent. Uh, when you're paying public employees the highest salary in the state, 
They make far more than university presidents, far more than the governor uh, of states. So it's, it's uh, significant. Now, so that's, that, that's one of the things. Right, another is that these kingdoms seek the spoils, all right, uh, that come with trying to attain the Iron Throne. So let's look at these figures. This is from the most recent bowl season. All right, just concluded. Andrea, where Georgia, you know, should have won the national championship, lost in that championship game to Alabama, but, you know, better team, obviously. All right, so right, right there for nothing. All right, so uh, ACC, the ACC collected $87.5 million from bowl games. This is just from bowl games now. This is a revenue stream from bowl games. All right, the Big Ten, the Big 12 collected 60 million, the Big Ten 89.5 million, the Pac-12 62 million, and the SEC 70 million. Now, four of those, uh, four of those conferences simply divide those up evenly. So the ACC uh, takes its what 14 members and, and divides 87.5 million up evenly. The Big 12 actually has 10 members, so. They have, you know, they get six million bucks each from their bowl season. Big 12, ha uh, Big 10 has what, uh, 12 or 14, I guess 12 or 14 members, so they divide it even. So that's a lot of money just from the bowl, uh, just from bowl generation. So the spoils that come with the Iron Throne and seeking the Iron Throne are significant. Who's this gentleman right here? And who is, who is Michael Kelly? The CEO of College Football Playoff. He is the CFO of the College Football Playoff, and he's also an alumnus of St. Thomas University. All right, so next. So we have those kind of insiders, those power power conferences, the power, you know, the, the power five that we just showed there. But there are outsiders that are also seeking to gain uh, the power and the bounty that comes with the Iron Throne, too. So <laughs> but look, look at the difference here in the revenue. The AAC, and not the ACC now, the AAC, of which uh, University of Central Florida is a member, they got $4 million from bowls in 2017-18, and that came from UCF playing in the Peach Bowl. Uh, UCF, you know, had a great undefeated season and uh, made it to one of the major bowls. Uh, a, the group of five which is another five conferences, but this would be like Conference USA, Mountain West, uh, Mid-American Conference. So not as prominent, not as preeminent. They divided 81.3 million from the bowls among five conferences. So you're probably talking about, you know, between 50, 60, 70 schools dividing that versus one conference dividing that with the, the uh, big time sports. Uh, there are three independents uh, that divided 928,000, so they got around 300,000 bucks each from the bowls. And then FCS, which is Football Championship Series, is what that acronym stands for. It's a smaller division than FBS. Uh, they were allotted $2.53 million from the bowls, and they had to divide that up among nine conferences. So you see that the bounty is not as significant for those mid-sized schools as it is for the big-time uh, college teams. Okay? Another theme. These kingdoms or conferences, they also develop alliances to try to strengthen and defend their position. So you have the Power Five, the ACC, the Big Ten, all of those. You know, they don't particularly want a usurper coming in like Central Florida and getting into those bowls because that takes away their money. So they make these alliances. They have, you know, the, the Orange Bowl pitted, who played in it? Miami versus uh, Wisconsin. All right, Big Ten versus ACC. That team's going to play in the Orange Bowl every year unless the Orange Bowl is hosting a semifinal game or a national championship game or one of the reps from those conferences is in those games. They've got, a, they've got an alliance with them. Um, there are bowl tie-ins, as I mentioned. There are rankings and seedings uh, in the basketball tournaments. Who, who's this right here? UMBC. All right, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Sebastian, what did they do this week that had never been done? 
number one seed as a 16 seed. As a 16 seed, they beat a number one seed. Had not been done in the men's tournament before. And uh, they, they whipped Virginia soundly. It wasn't like an upset. They beat them like 20 points, you know, or something. So, But it's rare. And let me tell you, it's rare even in men's college basketball, but it's not happening in college football because uh, UMBC is not going to play for, you know, they're not going to go to the Sugar Bowl. They're not going to go to the Orange. I don't even know if they have a football program. But UCF, which is, you know, a large institution and plays in a, you know, a fairly significant Division I conference, they were unbeaten. They, you know, they got into a big bowl because they met some criteria, like, you know, if you're ranked in the top 12 or whatever, I think you automatically go if you're in one of those gang of five conferences or group of five. But they didn't get a chance to play in the semifinals like Georgia, Oklahoma, Alabama, and Clemson did. And you're probably not going to have a better chance than they had this year, and it didn't happen. So it's unusual that those schools are going to get the opportunity to slay the dragon and to uh, – uh, to advance too far uh, in, in the Game of Thrones. All right. Now, still applying these storylines to college sports. College sports features dynasties. Remember we said dynasties. How do they pronounce it? Who watches Game of Thrones, by the way? All right. So how, how do they pronounce dynasty? I, I got an accent, but how do they pronounce it there? Do you remember? Dynasty. It's always dynasty. We have a dynasty. All right, well, there's a dynasty here. There are dynasties in college sports. Alabama's won five national titles in the last nine seasons. Uh, if you look, you know, the men's basketball tournament, we think about oh, all these teams are in it. They have, all have these great runs. But if you look at who actually wins it, of the past 27 seasons, four schools have won 16 of them. Duke, North Carolina, UConn, and Kentucky. I think it's like uh, maybe four... Three, three, I can't remember the, the, the breakdown of it. Maybe Duke's won five. I can't remember exactly how it is. But they've won 16 of the past 27. So really, you know, when you fill out your brackets, uh, yeah, you can you, you can pick a, you know, a 16 to be the one. Or Abraham, we were talking about that before. But when you pick the winners, most times you, you can pick some of these groups right here and, and be pretty safe. UConn's women... The women's basket, I had a student ask me, why don't, Dr. Edmund, why, don't, why don't we pick the women's uh, tournament? And I said, well, we can, but we might as well eliminate picking the one and two seeds because they never lose. Uh, UConn and Tennessee have won 17, UConn or Tennessee have won 17 of the past 27 tournaments. UConn scored, did anybody see that game the other night? Yeah. Oh, how many did they score? How many did they score in the first half? Yeah, I think they scored 90 in the first half. All right, so 90 points in a half. And uh, it was like 90 to 20 or something at halftime. Well, that's dominance. So you have these dynasties that rule big-time college sports. Same thing applies at every level, by the way. All right, now, last one of these themes or storylines. You also you remember I said good versus evil? And Dr. Reese, you're right on it. You're reading my mind. Great minds, you know. Uh, College sport features good, okay, Kirby Smart, John Snow, look at these handsome guys, you know, these great <laughs> leaders. And then over here, you know, you've got evil too, Nick Saban, Cersei Lannister, all right, so it's good and evil all along, and so you see that play out as well. Now, that was supposed to be kind of, you know, almost a joke. All right, so... We're going to switch gears. Now we're going to look at revenue streams and the three levels of, of college sports. And uh, that's Notre Dame's campus right here before a football game. Uh, revenue streams in big-time college sports. And again, I'm, I'm characterizing really about 65 schools as big-time college sports. Those are the Power Five conferences along with one independent, which is Notre Dame. That, I think that adds up to 65 schools. If we look at what generates revenue for those schools, uh, here are some. Here are the main ones, and these are not all of them. I've just tried to pick out the primary sources of revenue. Ticket sales is a big one. I think Notre Dame has sold out every home football game for 40 years or something like that, and so they generate a lot of money off ticket sales. 
meteorites. Uh, those conferences have a media tie-in on ESPN slash ABC. That's the most prominent uh, provider of meteorites. They pay to televise those games. Uh, some of these conferences, most of them now, have their own uh, networks, and we have one institution that has its personal network, and that's the University of Texas, the Longhorns Network. All right. Uh, we think about TV rights a lot, but there are also radio media rights. Like uh, all of these teams put their games on radio, they sell advertising, uh, they put signage in stadiums, so they typically sign separate contracts, uh, either by school or by conference, for media rights other than television, and they get a lot of money that way. Conference payouts which include the bowls and the NCAA men's basketball tournament. So the conferences split those up or divvy the money up uh, depending on whatever formula they put together. Often it's just splitting it evenly among the members. The SEC is a little bit different in football. Concessions, parking, licensing, all of those are revenue generators. And then donations or development, fundraising. Now. One of the things to keep in mind, and I think a flaw that a lot of, a lot of times people who uh, don't pay a whole lot of attention to college sport, maybe they even work at colleges, but I've had professors mention things to me, and there will be some misconceptions about college sport. Like a small school, the revenue streams, this is not what, they're, they're not going to be revenue streams like this for small schools. I mean, they might generate some off ticket sales, but it's not going to be much. And they might generate some from media rights, probably none, because you know small schools like to be uh, on television or on the radio. So we, we need to make sure we understand how those revenue streams work. Now, that's that's the big big time college sport right there. For mid-sized college sports, it's going to be different. And, here, and, you know, all of these have controversies and issues, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes, but look at the numbers here. There are, there are 130 Division I schools that play football. Only half of them are in those Power Five conferences. The rest of them are not. So they might be in a Conference USA or Mid-America Conference or these different conferences. They're not getting that big money from television contracts and media rights, guarantees, and bowl payouts. They're getting much less. Now, some of them are striving to, to get to that level. Other ones are very satisfied where they are. And other ones are really struggling for money. They're struggling financially to fund their sports. So they have to come up with revenue streams on their own. And notice this number right here. That's in small font probably. but. 347 Division I institutions in America. That's a lot of sport-playing institutions there, separate from those 65 big-time uh, college sport programs. So here's how they get their revenue to fund their sports. Uh, institutional support. Uh, so just, in other words, a school would build it into their annual operating budget for athletics. Uh, state of government support earmarked for athletics at, in higher education. You know, Georgia has a lottery, Florida has a lottery. I don't know how they divvy the money up, but I know that in Georgia, the lottery, which came after Florida's, was a boon for education, but I don't, I don't know how much they earmarked specifically for athletics, if any. Uh, ticket sales uh, can generate some revenue. This one's a controversial one right here, student fees. So student fees, a student, whether you play or not, pays a, sometimes will pay a fee that goes towards funding athletics at a school. Some students don't like that. Some faculty don't like that. And uh, so th that's, a, that's an issue that could be addressed. All right, gifts and development or fundraising again. All right, and then game guarantees. Drew, do you know what a game guarantee is? All right, so Florida Atlantic, which is the next slide, is going to focus on Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic goes up and plays Wisconsin. Why would they do that? To get exposure, and and that's true, very good point. And what else? There you go, money. So it's a game guarantee. So let's say that 
Florida Atlantic goes up and plays Wisconsin. Florida Atlantic had a great season last year. They go up to play Wisconsin. They get that exposure playing on ESPN, maybe on a Friday night or something. But they also probably got a check for like 1.5 million or something. So that can that can fund much of their athletics. Now, you're going to use FAU. I looked up for the presentation. I looked up their their operating budget for this academic year, and so. I don't know how it turns out because the fiscal year is not over, but they projected, uh, you know, and, and college sports are nonprofit entities, by the way. They're not supposed to make money, even though it gets a lot of attention. But Florida Atlantic projected that they would bring in $29 million in revenue and spend $29 million in expenses. And I didn't go through all of them, but here are their four main sources of revenue. Student fees was far and away their largest source of revenue. So let's say, you know, I don't know how many students are at Florida Atlantic, let's say 25,000. If they're all paying $10 a semester or $20 a semester, that's generating a lot of money. So whether they play on a team or not, they're paying, you know, they're, they're helping pay for athletics. Uh, scholarship or institutional support. So again, the institution budgets in for, to pay for the scholarships. Four million uh, conference distribution, two point seven million that gets kicked back from the NCAA ticket sales. They projected to sell two million dollars uh, a year before last. The year the year before Lane Kiffin came to Florida Atlantic, I think Florida FAU was third from the bottom in attendance of uh, Power Five and Group of Five schools. Out of those, whatever, you know, roughly 100 schools, they were third from the bottom in attendance. But, you know, you think about it, South Florida, there's a lot to do. It's not like, you know, Tuscaloosa is a nice town, but you're not going to the beach. You're not going to the beach. You're not going to have a, you know, you're not going to go out and play golf in uh, December the 15th like you can in Boca Raton or in Miami or whatever. So, not quite as much to do. All right, so, one thing to keep in mind here, though, is that in looking at that budget, and they, they, the Board of Trustees or whoever put together the report pointed this out. With all of the attention that athletics get and it gets, and it can be the front door to the university, still only 3.8% of the overall FAU budget. So it's not really, you know, it gets a lot of attention and when Lane Kiffin does something goofy, which I don't, you know, that we can rest assured he will, uh, this going to bring bring some attention, either positive or negative. Now, he, he's like the Donald Trump of college football because he's tw tweeting all the time. And uh, so it can make FAU look good. It can make them look bad. They had a great season. But really, in the grand scheme of things, about 4% of their overall budget is uh, devoted to athletics. Now, let's move now to small college athletics. And we'll focus on the NAI. St. Thomas is an example. Uh, but there are you know, hundreds of other schools. So our revenue streams here, and again, the, you can, like um, for Barry University, were they NCAA Division II? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, but I would still consider them small college. You know, that's a small college athletic department. Uh, Division Three, which is non-scholarship. Uh, in other words, they don't give athletic scholarships, they give other kinds of scholarships. And then NAI, um, of which St. Thomas is a member. The primary revenue generator is tuition, and this is where there's often a misunderstanding uh, about, uh, oh, if, if you know, if uh, they, they put in this program or that program, it's going to cost this much or that much. That's not the way, that, that's one way to look at it because they're upfront costs, but you have to look at it on an operating basis, uh, and the, the revenue generation from small college athletics is, is tuition driven. And I've got a couple of slides to explain that. Uh, fundraising is another way that small colleges can raise money or can get, generate revenue through athletics. Tickets and concessions, but tuition is far and away the most significant source. So when you see these small schools like St. Thomas and the school I was just at is in Georgia, when they put in sports programs, they're doing it, I mean, it, it, Ideally, if you do it right, it's for a variety of reasons that we'll touch on, but one big reason is to bring in students, to get to build enrollment, because students pay what? Well, what do students pay? 
to this, and there you go. And so college is run off of you. All right, so let's look at these revenue streams and how they work at a small college. A couple of terms you should know about. All right. Uh, one is roster minimums. And so, Christina, you're head coach of the, of the soccer program at St. Thomas, and I'm the athletic director, and I say, you've got a roster minimum of 20 players on your team. I don't care if you go 0-20 or 20-0, you've got to have 20 players on that roster. You'll get in more trouble with me if you don't have 20 players than if you go 0-20. All right, so that's a roster minimum. There are also scholarship limits. The NAI limits the number of scholarships each sport can have, okay? But most, very few schools fully fund their sports. So if, let's say that we allot Christina, and she got to have 20 players on that team, but we only allot her five scholarships. Well, I don't think it would be wise for her to go out and get five really good players and give them five full rides. She still, then she's got to get 15 people to come to school for free. So it's better to divide those scholarships up and you divvy them up and say, okay, I, I, I'll give Monica this much, I'll give Michaela this much, and you end up hitting your roster minimum by dividing those scholarships up, okay? So understand that the roster minimum is always going to be higher than the scholarship allotment. And now you 307 people, and Abernethy, I'm going to quiz you too. Uh, I'll put this on the exam, see, so you got to understand this so that you can explain it. Now, so let's look at men's basketball and give you an example of revenue generation. All right, in NAIA, a school can provide 11 full scholarships for men's basketball. Let's say that a given university decides to uh, fund the equivalent of five scholarships. All right, Nelson, you're the head basketball coach. You've got five full rides. Your roster minimum is, uh, let's say, 15, okay? So Nelson's got, you got to keep 15 players on there. He's got five scholarships to do it. That should actually be a nice little ratio, pretty easy to do, actually. So that means that the equivalent uh, of 10 students are paying to go to school. Okay, so the equivalent of 10 people are paying to go. The general guideline for athletic directors is that a student athlete will generate around $15,000 of gross revenue. That's, it's not exact for every school, but it's kind of a nice rule of thumb. So Arthur, if I ask you on the exam, you know, uh, how much does a single student athlete generate at uh, good old state U or whatever, small college, 15,000 gross is the, the answer I'm looking for. So in this example, Nelson's basketball team, he's got 15 players on that team. It, no matter how he divides up those five scholarships, the money comes out so that he's got 10 players who essentially are paying to go to his school. And so 10 times 15,000, that's $150,000 gross revenue from men's basketball. Monica, you see how that works? You got that? All right, so you can recite that back if that's an essay item. All right, so if we extrapolate that out and look at, you know, the, the biggest sport, which is right here, okay, and all right, when we go to a football roster, if you, if you put a football roster of 100 players there, and the roster, the scholarship maximum for NAIA is 24 scholarships. So if we say, okay, uh, Zuri, you're the head football coach. You've got 24 scholarships, but you've got to bring in 100 guys. Uh, you've got to have 100 guys on your team. That's the equivalent of 76 people generating $15,000 each. And again, that's a rough, gross estimate. So that's $1.1 uh, 